Well, I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. Shined a little light from heaven on my soul. And then he bathed my heart in love, and he wrote my name above. Just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Well, let us have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about our trouble. To hear our faintest cry, he will answer by and by. And you will feel a little prayer will turn it. No, a little fire is burning. Just a little talk with Jesus to make it right. Well, I may have doubts and fears, my eyes filled with tears. Yeah, but Jesus is a friend that watches day and night. And so I go to him in prayer, for he knows my every care. It just a little talk with Jesus to make it right. Yeah, let us have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about our trouble. To hear our faintest cry, he will answer by and by, and he will feel a little prayer will turn. No, a little fire is burning. Find a little talk with Jesus and make it right. Yeah, find a little talk with Jesus and make it right. I'll minister today for a few minutes uh, from the subject that we will title, Why Sit We Here Until We Die? revolve around three things. Number one, where we have been. Number two, where we are now. And number three, where we are going. Now, we as spiritual beings must realize that we need guidance and we need help from God. We also must understand that situations will come in our lives that will be difficult, hard, and then there will be the hardest situation and the greatest difficulties that we in our personal lives have ever faced. What we will need and what is required in such situations is that what is required is an internal strength. That internal strength is known as spirit, a strong spirit. We have seen people that has been muscular, strong, really work the flesh out in great shape, but they buckle and they fall underneath pressure because they do not have any internal strength. And internal strength is spiritual strength. You know this as well as I do. What, it, what, what is required in us to stand up to face the tough challenges of life, the terrible things that sometimes befall us, is an internal, is an inward strength that has nothing to do with one's physical conditioning, has nothing to do with their muscles, how strong or how big they are. It has something to do with what the strength is inside of a person. This is why, just based upon that simple knowledge alone, this is why we should understand that there is a spiritual man and that he must be exercised. That there is an inside man in me. There is an inside man, an inside woman in you and that inside person must be dealt with as much or more as the outside person. We take the vitamins, we take the medication, we run, we lift weights, we do everything we can do to keep this physical man in good working order. Denying then the strength of the very one, that internal person, who is going to make the tough decisions for you in life. A mother that is on some kind of a life support, a child that is on a life support, that has now come, do we keep it on or do we turn it off? Situations in life that come upon us that cause for great decision and then our ability to live with the decisions that we have made after we make them. All of that revolves around an internal strength, a strong individual inside. Someone asked, well, how do you exercise the inward man? Well, you can, as you take vitamins and you take all types of pills to help strengthen the body, there is a pill for the inside man. The pill for the inside man is called the gospel. How much study have you put into it? 
How much time have you put into it? It is the word of God that strengthens that inside man. The inside man has to eat, but the inside man cannot eat the food of the regular man. The spiritual man does not live on hamburgers, french fries, or natural foods, but the spiritual man must receive food in order to live. So if he's a spiritual man, he must relieve, receive spiritual food. What is the spiritual food? What is the spiritual medicine? What is the spiritual vitamins, the spiritual mineral? It is the gospel. It is the pill of God. It is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is, and I'm trying hard to emphasize, that no matter who you are, no matter what you're born into, poverty or wealth, there are going to come times that you are going to face the greatest difficulties in this world. A mother having a baby and springing on you instantly out of nowhere is a doctor that walks in and says, complications has arisen and either the child is going to die or the mother is going to die and you have to make the decision. Many people will buckle. Many people will run. Many people will seek to hide. Many people, listen, fear does one of two things. Fear either paralyzes us or fear mobilizes us. There are many people when they face a fearful situation, they completely shut down. They can't deal with it. They can't face it. And all they know to do is to run from it or to be paralyzed in it. There is a spiritual man that lives inside of you and that man must be fed, he must be exercised and he must, must be nurtured. We feed him with the word of God, the bread of life. We exercise him through what the Bible identifies to us as spiritual exercises is prayer, fasting, and giving. Giving of ourselves, giving of our lives to others. It makes us morally, spiritually strong. And so when the adverse things of life come upon us, we are able to face them in the strength of the Lord for he is the only thing that is able to strengthen the spirit and again I stress, whenever you are put in the great, great situations, when you're put in the situations that uh, are life and death, when you are brought to the hard spots of life, it is not the flesh, the strength of the flesh that you rely on or that gets you through. It is an internal strength and that is spirit. And so the spirit must be dealt with. I'm preaching today from the subject, why sit we here until we die? Because there is a story in the Bible that outlines this perfect for us that I've just explained to you. It was four leprous men found in the book of Kings. They was in the city of Samaria. And they had been, they had been surrounded outside the city. They had been surrounded by the Assyrian army. And if you've done any research in history at all, you will know that the Assyrian army was one of the most feared because they were brutal. What they would do to you, the way they would torture people, what they would do when they conquered cities, they were beast. And Samaria found themselves surrounded, which was one of the things that the, that the Assyrian army would do. They would surround a city that they was about to conquer. They would allow nothing to come out of the city they would allow nothing to go into the city and the city would literally sit there stagnant and die. Well, that's exactly the situation that the, Syri that the Samaritans found themselves in, those of Samaria. The Bible shows us and tells us that the famine that was inside the city had reached a level now that cannibalism was being practiced on the infant children, cannibalism. That's how bad it was. Well, there was four men that was in that city. And obviously these four men had some goods. They had some food. And they knew, we will not keep what we have need of for our lives if we stay here in this city. So we must leave it. We must run from the problem. And so they did. They took what little they had left and they ran as far as they could run. And this is something that we need to understand and learn about running. Is that like Jonah or like the four leprous men, 
Sooner or later, you're going to run out of running room. That's just all there is to it. Running has never been the solution to any problem. To any great problem, running has never been the solution. Because as many of you as have run from your problems, you've only learned that they catch up with you. And most of the times, they don't have to catch up with you because they leave with you and wherever it is you run to, they show up there the same time you do because the, per, the, the, the problems are inside you. We must resolve the problem, not run from it. These four leprous men ran. They ran far as they could run. They got away from it as far as they could get away from it. But it wasn't far enough. They got to the gate of the city and they stopped. They stopped because right outside the gate was the enemy that they knew would kill them. So they stopped at the gate. As they sat at the gate and seeing what they had for their food beginning to go away, reality began to dawn in their hearts and in their minds, realizing and knowing this. It's the same things fixing to happen to us here as was going to happen to us in the city. We bought a little time, but we solved nothing. So one of them finally realizing, look, the food's running out here. And he asked the hard question as reality began to dawn. And he asked this question. He said, why sit we here till we die? Something's going to have to be done. But what's going to have to be done, we're not quite clear. We're not quite sure. Another one said, well, we can go back into the city from whence we came. And the other one said, yep, but if we go back into the city, the famine is in the city and we're going to die there. So option number one, sit here until we die, offered no help, no hope at all. Solution number two, go back offered no help at all. You see, here's something about the past. As we seek to run from our problems instead of overcome our problems, we will find this, that there's two ways for you to fall back into who and what you was. One way is to turn and go back to what God brought you out of to turn and go back to what you had the sense to leave. You was with alcoholics. You left them. That was good. You was with crack addicts or heroin addicts. You left them. That's good. But that's only the start. Leaving it is not good enough because, listen, if you leave something in the same shape that you was and you remain in that same shape, the past has a way to eventually catch up to you. What was behind you, if you sit still long enough, will catch you. Sooner or later, there'll be a knock on your door if you're sitting still, if you've not overcome it, and it'll be the knock of one of the old friends, and the whole problem starts again. You will leave the past, but if you do not continue your march forward, your past will catch up to you. Why sit we here till we die? The other said, if we go back into the city, we're dead there. The other one said, we have but one option. That is to do what is counterintuitive. We must move forward. But if we move forward, we're going to move into the hands of the enemy who has caused this and they will kill us. Well, but there is the slightest of chances that they will not kill us. What they do with us, I don't know. But if they don't kill us, we'll be alive and at least we'll eat. So option number one offered no hope at all. Option number two offered no hope at all. Option number three offered little to no hope at all. You see, this is what I'm telling you. Life will bring us into some very, very difficult positions. And nobody really is going to be able to get you out of it but you. It's your problem. It's you that must deal with it. 
Oh, but the Bible says counsel. Yes, counsel is good. But once you receive counsel and it has been manifested to you what the problem is, if you didn't already know what it was, it is then left up to you to make the choice. Heaven or hell, the greatest decision you'll ever make. Yes, I can counsel you. I can bring you to the light of the knowledge of God and of his word. I can show you that as many as call upon his name shall be saved. But then it is left up to you and you alone to call on his name and be saved. So is it with every problem. If you already know what your problem is, then the real problem is you've done nothing about it. You've not confronted it. You've not faced it. And if you're not going to face the problem, the problem will never be solved. If it is true that something is wrong and you really don't know what it is, and godly counsel from someone brings it to light to you where you now know what the problem is, then it's left right back up to you again, now that you know, now that you've been enlightened. God has revealed to mankind that you are sinners born in sin. And in this condition, you are hell bound. In this condition, you cannot come to heaven except that you be born again. There's the counsel. There's the facts. There's the information. Now will you call upon the name of Jesus and be saved? It always comes back to us. All counseling can do is help you see a problem that you can't see. But once you see the problem, it will be up to you to lay the ax to the root of that tree. Life is filled with difficult decisions. Listen, I'm gonna read to you from the book of Kings, this story of these four men sitting at this gate. Here's what it says. And there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate and they said one to another, why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come and let us fall into the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. We're dead anyway. You see, this is where true faith is activated. True faith almost always hinges upon some kind of a sacrificial move. There are people right now who has the hard decisions to make. There is a wife that if she continues her walk with Jesus, she's going to lose her husband and she has to decide. There is a husband right now who has been saved and born again, but his wife wants to still party and go out. And it's reached a place now to where he knows that if he continues to walk with the Lord, continues to go to church, he's going to lose his wife. He's going to have to make a decision. You see, the Bible is not a book. The word of God, Christianity, is not something that always unites. It unites the brethren. But the Bible shows us that Christianity has been one of the greatest dividing factors in all of the human race. The Lord Jesus made it clear himself when he said, there shall be five in one house. Two shall be against three. Three shall be against two. When he said, I've come with a sword to set apart. The gospel separates. And one of the greatest decisions that you'll ever make is do I stay with a husband and leave God? Do I stay with a wife and leave God? Do I hold on to my cigarettes? The preacher's preaching against cigarettes. I'm offended. I'm going to keep my cigarettes and leave church. The choices of life, and some of them's very difficult, such as these men of which I've read to you about today. These four leprous men at the gate of Samaria. You can't get much more difficult than that. But they decided that they was going to move forward. There is no hope in sitting here. You see, stagnation, that's a major problem. Do you know that when water sits still, nothing's coming in, nothing's going out, it stagnates. And when water stagnates, it becomes polluted. It'll kill you. Did you know that air is the same way? 
black mold, the killer mold. One of the things that's required is stagnant air. No incoming, outgoing air movement. Anything that becomes stagnant, anything that stops moving will become infected and sooner or later become an agent of death. It must move. You see, moving is a sign of life. Growing is a sign of life. If it is alive, it grows, even with a cancer. If it is alive, it grows. There are some people that's been in church for 20 years, and the basic knowledge of the Word of God is the same right now as it was the day they got saved because they're fed constantly these pablum sermons by these hireling weak preachers that will not confront the issues of life. And therefore their congregants will not do it either. They're 20 and 30 years into the ministry, 20 or 30 years in church, and they know nothing more of the Bible than they knew the day they got saved. This is a dead spiritual soul. It is impossible to sit somewhere for 20 years and not grow. If it's in an English class, if it's in a math class, or if it's in a house of God. If you are sitting there for these many years, learned nothing, it is the teacher's fault. Or it is your fault. One or the other, you must move forward. You must continue to grow. You must grow, you must go, you must go, you must grow. They said we can't grow, we can't live if we sit still here. They said we can't grow, we can't live if we go back to what we came from. So the only choice that we have, which offers us little no, uh, to no choice at all, no hope at all, but it offers us the only hope that we've got, and it is to move forward. So is it with our lives. And that graveyard, that graveyard that's got the tombstone on it with your name on it. There ain't but one way you're going to get past that. There ain't but one way you're going to override that. You may think that God and Jesus and the Bible is some pie in the sky nonsense. But let me tell you something. Your monkey business, your evolutionary trash, offers you no hope at all, brother, to get beyond that tombstone that's got your name on it. It offers you no hope. It don't even promise you a hope. The only hope you got to go beyond that graveyard or that tombstone is in the Lord Jesus Christ and him alone. You don't have another choice. So if you think that faith in Christ offers little to no hope at all, it's better than any hope anything else in this world offers you, for it is the only hope you got. Like these men at this gate said, we're going to have to move forward. Well, something very strange happened when they moved forward. As it seems that something strange always happens when we confront and move forward. Things certainly change. Things will change. If you confront and if you move forward, things will change one way or the other. Well, one of these four leprous men left this gate and said, we're not sitting still any longer. And we're not going back to what we came out of. We're going forward. That signified and represented for us the step of faith. And as they began to move forward, the Bible in this chapter says that God sent into the ears of the enemy that was encamped about a great noise. And the enemy thought that they were being attacked on different sides by armies coming in. And the Bible says they fled. When the four leprous men got to the tents, they found all the food that they needed. They found all the gold that they needed. They found everything they needed. 
and the enemy was gone. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. If you will keep your feet under you and if you will keep moving. It is when we allow fear to paralyze us that we die. It's when we allow fear to paralyze us that we choose to run back, well, as a dog to his own vomit, to those weak and beggarly elements that we have left. It was under dire straits that the children of Israel, who come out of back-breaking bondage, said to Moses, let us go back to Egypt where we did eat freely. It's a very strange thing what happens to the brain when it refuses to confront and move forward. It'll start thinking your enslavement was freedom. It'll start telling you that your crack was your freedom. Your drugs was your freedom. If you sit still long enough, not confronting, you will go back or what's back there will come to you. There is only one thing to do when the chips are down. Only one thing to do when we find ourselves in the hard spot. And that is to stand up on our feet and say, live or die, I'm going in the direction of the Lord. Like Daniel said, put me in a lion's den, but I'll not stay here and bow down to your false gods. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego told those of ancient Babylon, cast me into a fiery furnace. If we die, we'll be out of your hands. God may save us alive, he may not. But let it be known unto thee, O king, this day we will be delivered from your hands. Cast us into a fiery furnace, but we will not sit here and bow down to you are your false gods. When they went into the fiery furnace, three of them went in, and when they looked in the furnace, four of them was walking around. Faith motivates God. Brothers and sisters, I encourage you from the depth of my soul not to let the troubles of the times strike fear into your heart, not to let it cause you to become stagnant, not to let it paralyze you, and certainly not to let it cause you to run back to the weak and beggarly elements of your past. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray God that each one of us today will hold on tightly to the gospel that was delivered unto us to let us walk forward. If it's fast or if it's slow, I care not. Move forward. Father, we ask in the blessed name of the Lord Jesus right here and right now for strength, courage, and faith to set upon the heart of every believer that's watching this program right now and let that believer stand up and say, I bind fear in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and I overcome this by the power of his blood. Remember the one that talked to you When you were lost, he told you what to do Remember the one that you leaned on When your world was ending and you were alone Look back at that cross, brother, as you walk off. Look at the treasures you will have lost. A blood-washed family, your children and wife. Blessed assurance, eternal life. Look at the treasures at the foot of that cross Then kiss them goodbye as 
you walk off Remember the one Your mama prayed to The one that she asked protect you Remember the one that made your dreams come true That eight pound boy that God gave you Look back at that cross brother as you walk off Just look at the treasures you will have lost the streets of gold beyond those gates of pearl a river of peace flowing out of this world look at the treasures at the foot of that cross and kiss them goodbye as you walk off Look at the treasures At the foot of that cross Then kiss them goodbye As you walk off